Welcome, everybody. I'm just going to give a couple minutes just in case people are still logging on. Everyone can get settled. All right. Welcome. My name is Lindsay Clark, and I'm running for mayor of Medicine Hat. And we are having a little forum here tonight. There are a lot of candidates running for council this year, so I wanted to um, give everyone a chance to uh, get to know me a little bit more uh, in the community. But while we're at it, we can get to know a few of the council candidates as well. And tonight we have Kelly Allard, Brian Webster, and Shyla Sharps. And we're going to just have a little bit of a chat. We'll get to know them a little bit and ask a few questions. And if we have time at the end, apparently there's a way that you can submit questions. And if you're familiar with technology, you probably know what that is already. So, Kelly, hello. Oh, muted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so, I uh, feel free to give a, a little intro about yourself for sure. And then I was uh, wanting to ask you what it was as a citizen, what was like the key issue or issues that really mm -hmm. drove you to run for council? Okay, um, I grew up on the West Coast, mostly in the lower mainland of BC where I met my late husband, Carl. Uh, we moved to Red Cliff uh, with my two kids in 89, his parents lived there. Uh, we moved to the Hat in 96, so been here about 25 years now, yeah. Um, love it here. Sun all year round. I, I used to live in Prince Rupert, the rainiest city in Canada, and I moved to the sunniest city in Canada, so I'm never going back to the coast. Um, my late husband, he did, uh, he worked out of town most of the time, pipelining, long haul trucking, so I was at home with the kids and, you know, worked some jobs here and there, and yeah, when the kids grew up and were gone, I went trucking with him. He was hauling flat back deck B trains, and so yeah, helping them throw the throw the belts and the tarps and chain it up on Rogers, you know, in the winter time, <laughs> all kinds of fun. So, okay, so um, my top concern is a citizen. Um, you can say Ted Clugston inspired me to run because last fall, when they wouldn't hold a vote on the mass bylaw, I was irritated. Uh, they finally brought one in a couple of days before the province did, but just them not deciding, not taking a stand on anything. You know, that the worst decision is indecision. So that irritated me. And then uh, since I launched my campaign, February 2nd, um, I've learned of a lot of disturbing things down at City Hall. Uh, and, and then when the whole Invest Medicine Hat request for proposal blew up, that got me angry. I started digging. Uh, what I found out is they, actually changed the standard contract to allow city employees to bid. And then our city manager, Bob Nicolay, tried to feed us a line of BS, uh, telling us that everything on about the RFP was above board. I got a little angry. Um, to paraphrase an old movie, <laughs> said, listen, if you didn't know it was going to seem unethical, you're too effing dumb to keep this job. If you did know, you're in on it. Either way, you're out, you know. Um, I started digging and some very interesting information came up. I've got it posted on my website, my campaign Facebook page. I don't speculate. I find facts and I present them. Um, Orca, the sole uh, bidder on the request for a proposal for this 10-year contract, was made up of six senior Invest Medicine Hat employees. They incorporated February 21st. 2021, the request for proposal was not issued until June 15. No publicity. Uh, Bob Nicolay called it an oversight. There's 18 plan takers. Orca was one. 34 days later, guess who the sole bidder was? So, yeah. So, Kelly, obviously this has been a really divisive issue. Mm -hmm. If you were elected, what would you do to kind of unify the community and go forward in a more positive direction? <laughs> Okay, you mean on COVID? 
no, just like the, the community is pretty divided on, on COVID and then there's the Invest Medicine Hat issue. There there was like, there's been a lot of feisty debate and mm -hmm. people are kind yeah. of um, seem a little bit frustrated with each other right now. What would you do to kind of uh, heal that or, or unify yeah. the community? Okay, well, you know, the city, the council needs to take the lead in... Um, in the fight against COVID, they should be the ones to take the heat, not the business owners. Uh, I know that uh, City of Calgary, they brought in a bylaw that um, for all non-essential businesses to do the exemption. So now the people that are angry about having to show their vaccine passports, well, now they can get angry at City Hall instead of the business owners. You know, they're not fighting, sorry, my stupid cat. <laughs> Well, at least show us the cat then. <laughs> he just, I just threw him. Oh, <laughs> he'll be up again, I'm sure. Yeah. What do you? What are you? What? What do you think about? Um, like just the in terms of communication with the public, how to, uh, so that as council we can lead in a more positive direction, so it doesn't seem, it, so that when we're speaking, we're kind of modeling positive communication. Is that something that you would look to do? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, even council's kind of been infighting each other on this, you know. Um, oh, I'm just drawing a blank here, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> we can, we'll move, we'll move on to Brian and then at, okay. at the end, if you remember what you were gonna say, we can come back. Sure, sounds okay. good. Okay, awesome. Brian Webster. Oh, you got on mute. You're muted. That's, our, that's on our end. Sorry, Brian. Uh, so you wow. um, you have a lot of uh, you worked for the city for some time in the fire fire department. Uh, what do you think uh, your uh, experience and background would would add to um, your role as a council member if elected? And please feel free to give some also an introduction about yourself as well. <laughs> Okay, so just quick intro, if I can do that. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so you're right. I, I spent uh, 40 years in the fire service, um, 16 at CFB Suffield, where I was worked my way up through the ranks from uh, firefighter to, to inspector to, to chief fire inspector. And uh, then I moved into Medicine Hat in 1996, where I worked on the floor for about 10 years, uh, worked in prevention for two years. I was chief training officer for seven years and then deputy chief for the last uh, five years of my career. Um, so my education, most of my post-second, or a lot of my post-secondary education has been done on um, leadership and uh, working within the public service. Or, and, and so, I, I think that I'm a strong leader. I think that uh, I have some very good skills that way. And, uh, you know, I've, I've taken a lot of different uh, programs and I've done some political science classes as well. So those all help out, those help. Uh, in addition, the experience that I have in the fire service, my last, like I said, my last five years as deputy chief, part of what I did was look after budgets. So I understand how the city budgeting system works. Um, okay, so I am interested in your, your uh, you've taken lots of leadership courses. Is there a particular leadership style that you, or I don't know, theory that you adhere to? Well, I, I do, uh, I guess there's lots of different theories there. My biggest one is you lead by example. Like Kuzin, Kuzin and Posner have, they talk about modeling the way and, and sharing, having a shared vision and encouraging the heart. Um, I think if we do that in our normal lives as well as in, in uh, the workplace, we'll get a long way, we'll get a long ways. You know, like there's a lot of good employees within the city itself. And there's some really awesome people in the city of Medicine Hat that, that uh, are smart people. They have some really good ideas. Mm -hmm. So, I'll ask you as well about your the communication with the public and and how you would encourage greater transparency uh, between City Hall and the public. So, 
really right now it's more opaque than transparent with the city. Um, I think that we need to have more or less, uh, mm -hmm. actually less mm -hmm. in-camera meetings. And of course in-camera means the exact opposite of what you think it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, in camera means that the meetings are closed to the public. There's no notes kept or or anything. So, so you know, one of our campaign advisors is speaking. <laughs> um, you know, so so those meetings have to open up. And I mean, there's certain things that that you can't discuss in public. I get it, but it seems like they have all of their meetings in in uh, a lot of meetings in private, and they come out and. Sorry. What, what maybe everyone missed at the beginning is that Brian has his two campaign advisors with him tonight. And what are their names, Brian? Ranger and Leah. <laughs> okay. And Leah is sleeping quietly at my feet right now while chewing on the ball and Ranger is upset. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, sorry for the distraction. Um, yeah, so they need to, uh, they need to open the meetings up. Uh, and quit uh, having them behind closed doors. Uh, I mean, you you look at the council meetings that, that we've all attended lately, um, you know, they come out and everything is just universally agreed to. And uh, there should be, there should be room for discussion. And, and uh, everybody, if you have a different opinion, you shouldn't come out with just one one idea like you should be able to have that discussion in public because the public wants to know what's going on what you're thinking and we're there to represent the public we're not there to represent our own best interests yeah thanks brian i i do agree that debate is very healthy um as long as you know you have to do it respectfully but ha having people with differing opinions is really important to arriving at the best decision that's inclusive for the community yes so Shyla Sharps, hello, yes. um, welcome. And uh, I have a question for you as well. Okay. And please feel free to also give a little bit of a background about yourself or why you're running, whatever you kind of want for an intro. Okay. Um, as a business owner, mm -hmm. do you feel the business community has been engaged in discussions enough over the last four years to ensure their needs are being met? Okay, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about myself or why I'm running first. Um, I've been contemplating for the last two elections on running. Um, and every time I do, and I tell this story all the time, because this didn't just happen because I was bored over COVID. So the last two elections, I keep thinking I'm going to run. Um, and then I always kind of say, I kind of have a checklist of pros, cons, and, you know, a couple of lists. Can I do this? And all my concerns. And my one concern was always time. Um, and as my business has grown and I have better technology, I'm actually able to make sure that I have the time. And then the last column was always, I had to really ask myself, am I a good enough adult to sit at the table? And the answer was always no. So until that answer was internally, yes, I wasn't prepared to sit at the table because, well, because I wasn't always a good adult. So I knew that I wasn't ready. So <laughs> when, now that I feel like I can play in the sandbox and be more participative versus maybe just an angry business owner for the last 10 years downtown, which leads into my segue <laughs> of answering the question. <laughs> hard no, hard, hard no. You know, and I can only speak for maybe um, myself and a, a bit of a sampling downtown. You know, I can, I see that sometimes Briar Park is very engaged and there's, you know, certain business owners up there. So Briar Park seems to have good communication with the city and it just seems to be always the same people that have the engagement that um, are involved in the conversations. Now, when you come downtown, you know, here's a really good example of the lack of conversations they are literally shutting the street a block next to me and putting in more concrete. And there wasn't any conversations mm. with us. Now, maybe there was on, you know, with the one block vicinity around that um, concrete heaven, but it sure didn't come down the road. So, you know, I'm a downtown business owner. I have a lot of traffic come down. I'm a service industry. It's just, it's that lack of conversation that is so frustrating. You know, 
when I look at the downtown and I look at our community, we desperately need business down there that'll pay taxes. So, you know, I'm sure everybody knows, but just to recap, anything that's provincial, federal or city doesn't pay taxes when they have a building downtown. So, and nonprofits, all the nonprofits don't pay taxes, provincial building doesn't pay taxes, any of the city buildings don't pay taxes. So that kind of leaves the ma and pa's down there picking up the entire burden. And the problem we're running into is that we're picking up in Medicine Hat almost two and a half times the tax gap of any other community. So when you're getting frustrated why businesses aren't moving here as citizens, there's your answer. So that concrete pad that I keep getting really upset about, I'm upset because we've had businesses beg to get on there, cash deals to get on there, and were absolutely turned away by Invest Medicine Hat. And those businesses would pay taxes, which means that we can pay for the other stuff that we want, like, you know, like hockey hounds and, you know, ice rinks and recreation centers. So one leads to another to another. It's all one big equation. But if you take out all the, you know, addition signs, all you have is chaos. And that's what we've done is take out all the addition signs, any minuses. There's no longer an equation. It's just numbers that they're not communicating with us. So in case you didn't know, my answer is I'm frustrated. Okay, so what are some steps that you think the city could take to improve that discussion? Obviously having discussion is one of them. Sure. But what's the best way avenue to, cause it's, you know, there's a lot of businesses downtown and you wanna make sure that everyone gets heard. What, what are some strategies that you would use to engage everyone? Okay, good question, Lindsay. And I wanna kind of point out something that we didn't do. So for years, we've had the CCDA down there and here's what's really interesting. Um, you have to apply to sit on that board. And I did, and I never got chosen. In fact, if you look at the last board, there was nobody, There, sorry, there was one person that was actually a downtown business owner. The rest of the board were out of the parameter of the perimeter rather of downtown. So I'm like, wait a minute, you own a business on railway and you're going to tell me what I'm doing. And that was the last two boards. So that's the kind of thing that really disengages people, right? So what I would do kind of using the same model is, and it's really simple, it's talking. So we could easily with all our different committees and boards that are sitting on the uh, city website, how hard is it to start another business alliance one? Maybe it's six month terms because business owners are busy and we're busy trying to keep our doors open and not get yelled at for making exemptions or not exemptions. And, you know, all we're trying right. to do is run our businesses. So get us to the table, get us talking. And, and maybe it's not a two year commitment, but it's just a conversation. So I would like to see a task force of council and uh, city. And I don't mean just city leadership. I mean, city. Right. Today, while I was walking my dog, I got to meet a, a great guy in the dog park that happened to be a city employee. I had no idea. And yes, I was totally campaigning. However, what was amazing about it is he had so many ideas and we, and he wasn't management. Our employees are the answer. And we just keep turning the page and saying, oh no, there's gotta be another answer. Can't be that, can't be that. So I'm saying, let's talk. Right. Uh, Kelly, over to you. Do you have any thoughts on um, that uh, engagement and, and especially with the business community? Because, you know, part of what I'm seeing in my platform is we really new, do need to focus on our, our existing business uh, retention and expansion and making sure that they have what they need to be happy because then mm -hmm. it's evidence that you have a good business environment. And so you're well on your way to other businesses wanting to come here. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, um, part of uh, what's driving business away is the mess down at City Hall. Um, I actually uncovered some evidence, uh, you know, when they hired Bob Nicolay, our chief administrative officer, city manager, he was hired in October, 2018. January, 2019, his uh, son-in-law, who'd always worked in Calgary before his entire career, and who'd been unemployed, unemployed for about seven or eight months, gets a job with the city. And then 30 months later, um, where is it? He's, uh, he's now manager of gas operations. So, you know, 
I mean, the guy might uh, be very qualified. He might be great for that job, but it looks like nepotism. And, you know, that's the image that our, our city is presenting. And there seems to be a lot of uh, backdoor deals and, you know, outside business, they don't seem to like that. And yeah, so businesses be- that are here are getting frustrated with it too. Yeah. So to be fair, we don't, we don't fully know the background of that situation. No. And I think just to summarize, you're saying that if city treated people fairly uh, within the business community, and if there was a perception that the business is fair and it's a place that, you know, everyone gets an equal opportunity, that would encourage businesses. Oh, absolutely. Because um, they seem to be able to tailor their request for proposals so that they can And I don't know if this is true or not. This is what it comes across as, you know, perception is reality. So people are feeling, uh, businesses are feeling that they're missing out on city contracts because uh, the the proposals aren't fair. Uh, You know, that whole Invest Medicine Hat request for proposal, they actually uh, changed the standard contract to allow city employees to bid on that. Well, how is another business gonna compete? You know, that the, the city employees already have the inside track on that one so i think yeah that's a that's an issue of trust and not just being not just like we have to be fair and transparent but we also have to look like that we have to yes we have to be seen as being fair yeah Yeah. exactly how about you brian do you have any thoughts on um what it would take to get our economy or our local businesses to uh be excited about working here and and, uh, you know, even to the point where maybe they're out being ambassadors for other businesses to come here. Well, yeah, there's a couple things. Uh, the first one is the city needs to straighten if its finances out. Um, they're, they're not, uh, there's some things with the city finances. I mean, they went from uh, a debt servicing ratio of 31% five years ago to 62% uh, earlier this year. You know, so that's that's uh, doesn't send a good message to the. It seems like there's a spending problem within the city. In addition to that, uh, they brought in the financially fit program uh, five years ago, where they f- realized that there was a uh, $25 million shortfall in the, the operating budget, and through a five-year plan, they were going to reduce the operating budget by five million dollars a year to uh, to shut that to close that gap. Well, in January of this year, it was uh, estimated to be $27 million after layoffs and facility closures and the other processes that, that they uh, had done. So, you know, they, they need, the city needs to get their, their act in, in shape there, I guess. Um, we need to focus on our, our businesses in town. I think that, uh, I think that what we see is, is the small business are the ones that, that support the local economy and the medium size. We're not going to get the Boeing aircraft manufacturers to come into Medicine Hat. It's just not practical. We're not going to have any, uh, and I don't want to sound like a naysayer, but we don't ha- we don't have the the major facility right now for that to happen. We need to look at the uh, the smaller business, small and medium businesses to make that happen for us. Uh, Medicine Hat's grown at a population of 0.5% uh, per year, which is something that probably no other municipality in, in the province can say. You know, lots of cities have had booms and busts and and they've uh, grown exponentially and, and of course their infrastructure hasn't kept up with it. Um, so yeah, we need to, uh, to to support our local businesses as well. And we have some some employers that have been here for a long time, which are major uh, major contributors to the community, to the community like Methanex and uh, CF Industries and uh, CanCarb and the base. Um, and to Shyla's point too about the, the difference in tax for the property from business and residential, um, that's certainly something we need to make things attractive to the people. Um, same as uh, another area is selling off the, the electric generation. Um, that's craziness, uh, so. Thanks, Brian. I, I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions and uh, 
put them in the chat and we will try our best to get to them. Uh, uh, just on the economic development piece, I think what we've sort of been lacking, really been lacking over the last uh, four years at least, is that long-term strategic plan. Where are we going? Because we shouldn't just be taking a shotgun approach, like here's a grant or, you know, this business approached us. Okay, it should be more of a strategic approach. Like we need to recognize, as Brian was saying, what do we have here now? And what, what kind of industry does that, like what's downstream and upstream from our current industries? What, what businesses could be suppliers for our existing businesses? What, what are the good fits for our current assets, which include our businesses, our communities, our gas and electricity? Um, and then once we have that value, that's when we can start targeting those particular industries that work well with with what we have. And, you know, we, we, you know, in some cases we do want to uh, encourage certain, we want to incentivize things, but we have to know exactly what we're incentivizing and target it so that we're actually getting a return on that incentive. An incentive shouldn't just be giving someone money. You have to know right. how to target that money to actually encourage uh, the behavior or the activity that you are wanting to encourage. Um, we do have one question about encouraging infill development. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone want to take a stab at that? I'm, I can, you know, definitely a brownfield strategy, sh strategy should be part of our economic development strategy. Um, obviously, the infrastructure liabilities we already have, it'd be good if we could utilize the infrastructure we have, it keeps our taxes low and doesn't we don't incur any additional or we would incur very little additional infrastructure liabilities. Um, Shyla, do you want to take a crack at that one? Absolutely. So um, I do actually have a few, you know, ideas, I, you know, there's some real estate experts, I'm sure that we should be working with instead of just having an internal person. Um, and here's the thing, I'm going to just kind of digress a little back. We have an amazing host of realtors in this town that before we had IMH, they were self-driven. We weren't paying for it. And somebody that's driven like that, they really do bring the best forward because they have to um, sell that property for the right reasons, right? There's a long-term relationship after. So I really like the fact of, you know, using our local um, talent management here. So now when we talk about the infill properties, I'm a typical, I'm a really good example. 16 years ago, I used to be on Kingsway 17 years ago. And I thought, mm, I'm going to go buy a building. So I went around and I wasn't actually going to build downtown. I was looking at different infills and it was like beating my head against a wall. I, you know, honestly, I live in Medicine Hat and from Medicine Hat. So I know where City Hall is. I know who most of the players are. And honest to God, I could have had a drink on the first day. Trying to get through the red tap, the red tape was awful. So here's the thing. I think we could probably try to move businesses and people and residential or whatever we're talking residential or commercial in that direction if it wasn't so painful. So I would have gladly done a, a you know, startup right on an infill because I could have designed it versus taking a 1917 building that has all sorts of, you know, can't do this, can't do that. I mean, it's beautiful, but it's not the point. So we need to reduce that in order to even drive the traffic there. And then I would say, let's meet with the, not just Invest Medicine Hat, but really a group of people like that do commercial realty and say, what do you have on the table that aligns with Medicine Hat? And, you know, there's lots of things to Brian's point is what do we have? What is, what is our brand in Medicine Hat? And really, other than the gas city, <coughs> we haven't we don't know what our brand is, but yet we're surrounded by agriculture. We could be looking at vertical grow ops, you know, meaning, you know, not ops, like as in drugs, but the regular <laughs> grow ops. Sorry, short word. Um, we could be looking at like our ranchers, like have we looked into regenerative farming and things like there's so much that we could do locally. We've got CP rail running through here. We've got tracks behind Briar Park. I know that I worked in Briar Park for years as an HR manager. And we didn't utilize the tracks. 
British military many years ago tried to set up, a couple of my clients tried to set up local manufacturing. I literally walked them down to the street to IMH and City Hall and they got nowhere, like nowhere. So, and not that I'm trying to make this about IMH, but I'm trying to make this about, let's get rid of the bureaucracy. Let's get rid of uh, the, you know, cause that's what they were meant to be, but we really, our customer service is extremely poor. I want to be able to bring a client in when I bring a physician in or I bring something like that in and they go, oh, I think I'll build my own office and I can, should be able to take them down. They can maybe look at an infill property because we really do want to get those occupied and taken yeah. care of, right? So, yeah, and I think just with bureaucracy, that's, that's kind of a, a word that could mean a lot of different things. Sure. And I think what you're talking about and, and I think what I I want to see is effective government services we're right. here to help and yes. you know being um commute person first like you yes. treat everyone with respect and like there's somebody um kelly we're we've been talking about maybe some things that were not um as as uh, great over the last four years what do you think the best things about our community are or what are some of the best things oh um the climate we've got our little slice of heaven here you know we just get so much sun sunshine um coming from the coast winters are dark and dreary and when i go back there you know to visit my mom or something i just get so depressed i'm so glad to come back home all the time we're at a great location uh we're small but you know we're a big enough city that we have a lot of services you know i can get on my motorcycle and 10 minutes i'm on the highway and you know i can just ride for miles and miles we're a great uh great location for um you know tourism great stopping off point because we've got the cypress hills that not too far from the great sand dunes and the hoodoos and you know we can stop here and do day trips everywhere it's we've got a fantastic city i love it and apparently amazing mountain biking. I just learned that oh. today. <laughs> and dog oh parks. Uh, Brian, how about you? What do you think? Like you've you've lived here for a while, a long while. And uh, what do you think? We What are our assets? Where's our potential lie? A long while, yeah. I've lived here since 1972. <laughs> That's a while. It was just a little little gaff from when we moved here. Um, our biggest asset we have, is, I think, is our people. We have an awesome group of people in this city. Um, you know, they're they're always willing to talk to you and and to uh, to lend a hand. And and you know, you walk down the street, you say hello, and they'll say hello back. Uh, try that in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's not <laughs> such it's not quite the same reaction. Um, the other things we have is, you know, we, we generate our own electricity, which is something that no other community does. We, we as citizens or uh, Medicine Hat have paid for the, or I guess our forefathers is probably the better way to put it, started our, uh, our generation and our uh, electric generation, sorry, gas, um, gas fields. Um, you know, so that, that's something that, that we need to keep and, and to explore explore or continue to improve um, and supplement it however we can. Um, you know, as, as Kelly said, we have the weather here that, that's phenomenal. Um, and we need to, we need to uh, develop plans with SMART goals. SMART being specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound or time sensitive, not visions. And, and that's what's happening right now is there's way too many visions occurring and, and, and so we need to do that. And we do have, we do have a lot of exp expertise in the city. We have uh, our, the city staff and, you know, of course we keep going back to the city staff. They, they come up with some awesome ideas because they've been, around, they've been around the block and they don't necessarily sit there and go, well, we've always done it that way, so it must be right. They come up with some pretty inventive stuff. Mm -hmm. We ran into that. We had that in fire service a number of times. Yeah. Uh, natural resources, like I say, uh, um, we are on the uh, the border of 
two major highways in, in, in this area. Um, unfortunately, with the rail, there isn't really the offloading like would be nice to have. Um, but yeah, the transportation is good. So yeah, yeah. So um, we have a question about um, how having local companies bidding on projects and 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 not getting them, and don't we want to support our our local um, our local companies in the RFP process? And I think on that one, we just need to be more transparent about what the process is. Uh, there are some treaties that and and agreements that prevent us from having a local preference, but certainly um, we we do want to support our local businesses in in every way that we can. Uh, that's my like lawyer hat, I guess. Not not it's not legal advice, but it's you know from from that perspective, you know we we have these agreements that we have to abide by. What are some other ways that we could you know, ensure that our, our local businesses are uh, being f successful, feeling feeling like we're being fair and transparent, Sh Shaila. Well, um, probably the worst person to ask because what's really funny is there is no treaties or government around recruiting um, currently. And the city of Medicine Hat uses Calgary agencies and it's really quite frustrating and they have for decades. Um, they use Calgary agencies. We tend to use retained search agencies, which is incredibly expensive. Um, and it's it's really hard to watch as a citizen um, that we're just pouring this money into retained search and, and recruiting. Now, you know, and that's not a dig against HR people because I know that sometimes it's overwhelming to go through all these resumes. And, and that's what recruiting agencies do is, you know, we can help scope that down. And so it's well worth the money because we don't tend to get paid unless we, you know, fill a position or get a candidate. But when we're outsourcing that to Calgary agencies, that's a right kick. So I think we need to be really transparent. And if there is a vendor locally, have a, like metrics that they need to meet. Like if, if they were hoping that I had millions of dollars worth in sales or they want certain things or they want me to have a background specifically in technical recruiting um, and I don't meet the requirements, that's one thing. But when you don't even meet with your local, how do you know it's on the table? So it's hard to say, let's support our local business when you don't know what our local business does. So again, you know, going back to my task force, maybe as council and task force, we literally pick five businesses and we go visit and we learn. And even if we think we know what they do, do we? Like, do we? So I think we need to ask that question and go check it out. So the next question that we have um, in line is, are we really the gas city anymore? That's a good question for a minute. We were going to be the grass city. That was yeah, a yeah. hilarious meme that went around for a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, my my um, thinking on that would just be kind of to Brian, what Brian was saying earlier, and a, a number of people definitely have mentioned in their platforms as well, is that we generate our own electricity and we use natural gas to do it. So we are still the, the natural gas. In, we're still in the natural gas business in a way, um, but obviously we're going to be able, we're going to need to transition to other forms of electricity and and make sure we're ahead of the uh, energy transition so that we protect the value of our assets. Kelly, what are some of the things that you think we could we could do to um, get ahead of the the energy transition? Do you have any thoughts on like renewables or that kind of thing? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, they, they tried that solar plant project here, and that was a, a dismal failure because uh, that was a, a process that was only used in the southern states. You know, it was uh, basically heating up a, a liquid, which is, it, it just didn't work in Canada. I mean, we could try other solar plants, uh, they're, they're building them all over the place. I mean, we spent, uh, I think it was $12 million they spent on that. Half of that came from the city coffers. The other half was government grants. And, you know, we need to do our homework before investing millions and millions into new resources. Uh, they're talking about this hydrogen hub. Well, I'm not sure how well that's gonna work. Uh, we 
green hydrogen comes from using water, using electrolysis to, se to separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, and that's where you get your hydrogen. Well, we don't have a whole lot of water here. We're a semi-arid area. And the other hydrogen they're looking at is blue hydrogen, which um, recent studies have come out saying that that's more polluting than coal is. So, I mean, we really have to do our homework before um, investing any money into this. You know, they're, they're doing a study on how the hydrogen hub would work here, but, you know, now the city's talking about, oh, well, we can start, um, before the study's even done, we can start developing these procedures and these, no, we, we can't. We need to wait for the results of the study and find out what the real numbers are. We're getting, you know, the, these reports, they're all just sunshine and rainbows and they don't have any actual figures to them, no cost estimate, you know, nothing, so. Right, yeah, it is it is so important for us to rely on evidence and data when we're making decisions and, yeah. you know, have those performance metrics as well. So, you know, before we're spending any money, we have to make sure, A, that it's a priority for our city, given that we don't, you know, we're in a tough economic time. Mm -hmm. And B, that it's backed up by evidence that what yes. we're trying to accomplish is actually going to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, so, Brian, um, we, uh, we have, I'm just going to read the question. <laughs> That's up. The character and soul of our city comes from its historical buildings. Please share your ideas on how to protect our heritage resources, such as heritage buildings, First Street, Southeast, and the historic feel of downtown. Do you want to do you want to defer to Shyla on this one? I'll come back to you. Um, she really wants to answer it, Brian. Well, I would just like to. I would love Brian to answer. I just want to give you some feedback that somebody go, that's going through the process. Go ahead, Shyla. Okay. 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 I you're really shy here, aren't I? Um, so interesting. 1917 church. When I first tried to get historic status, because you know anything over 100 years, I can. Um, it, it kind of got stalled because the Historic Society of or Medicine Hat and our, our committee at City Hall was really backlogged. Now, all since COVID, they've all been completely shut down. So it's really hard to get it. So even though that's all good in theory, we need to regenerate. We need to get Malcolm Sissons back on board. We need to get all this expertise back to the table and helping us do this. Um, we've got some phenomenally smart people in this town, and it would be great if we could get these buildings done. But what was really interesting is, um, I know originally when I went to the city to find some of my paperwork, they said, oh, no, it wasn't built till 19, I don't know, 50 or something. But I actually found the paperwork in an old church archive that showed 1970. So we need to get people back to the table that have that expertise and get these buildings uh, historic status quickly. Yeah, I part of it, I think, too, we have amazing archives at the city. And it's, ex it's exciting to kind of go down and look what get the downtown used to look like and right. kind of protect that. And I think if we, you know, encourage people like younger people to be interested in the, the heritage that our city has, like what it looked like before, what We've had an incredible history. We had a POW camp. It wasn't downtown. But right. Just that history and, and kind of buying in and being encouraged and interested in what your city was and is and, and Absolutely. You know, trailblazing roots and how we can tap into those going forward. Um, so, Brian, can I, jump, I, think I give you a different one? No, can I jump in with something? Because you just hit on a really good point. Okay, go for it. So we talk about histor history and, and the historic buildings downtown, and there's some beautiful buildings. I know from my, my time in fire prevention, uh, we, got, we went down and, and uh, did inspections in the buildings. My apologies, Ranger wants to talk. Um, Ranger and what was the other? That was one of the questions that we got. Ranger and... <laughs> Leia. Leia, okay. Like Princess Leia from Star Wars. Ah. <laughs> um, so to... to digress a little further, you know, we call Medicine Hat the gas city. Uh, there's a reason for that. And it's not necessarily because there's medicine, uh, there's a lot of gas underneath the city. Rudyard Kipling came here um, a number of years ago before my time. Um, 
and he he like he talked about Medicine Hat having all hell for a basement, and you know so there's a lit literary side of things too about about the history of Medicine Hat. There's Ranger. <laughs> So, so there. So that's what I was kind of going to get at. Like we've got some beautiful buildings in the city that need to be looked after, like the Monarch Theater, and and you know, there's been some some uh, restoration done on the, some of the buildings downtown, and and even looking at the writing on on the sides of some of the buildings, um, like the the Sweet Cap Sweet Cap Ralph cigarettes on the one side of the building, and and Marshall's printing on the side of the building on Second Street. So we need to look after that. I, I like the old stuff. You know, there was a time when they needed to tear down all of the existing buildings. And we had a beautiful city hall here uh, where the, the park is on 2nd and 6th Avenue. Um, of course, they painted it lime green for a while. That was pretty nasty. But uh, so, okay, that's my, that's where I just wanted to jump in. And I, I was going to jump in about, um, you know, they spent a lot of money uh, refurbishing the Monarch. And then after the city bought the Monarch, they shut it down instead of keeping it going. We had people that could run it as a movie theater. And now there's concerns, um, you know, about rodent infestation, you know, the mice getting in there, all those beautiful seats that they just finished fixing up, the mice are going to get in there and destroy it. So, you know, the buildings that we do have, we should be using them to you know, well, and what's interesting, just to add on to that, is the city now owns it, so it doesn't pay taxes, um, we, whereas we had private buyers that were willing to buy it, which would have made it privately owned, which would have made it taxable. Wow. So we got to quit doing um, silly things like this. Yes. Like, we are walking away from low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. So I there's two more questions, so I'm, I want to keep it pretty tight. Sorry. Um, we have a, a college that's graduating um, employment, job ready employees every year. What way could we, what could, sorry, what could the city do to attract and keep these grads at home to contribute to our tax base rather than another community? How can the city get Hatters interested in joining a city board? Oh, so just like getting people interested in our community. So that's, I guess, two questions. So what about the, what about the job attracting young workers to stay here and, and live here at Kelly? Okay, well, one thing, uh, we could use some more affordable housing. Uh, a friend of mine was looking for an apartment recently, and I guess there was 20 people looking for the same apartment. You know, we're building these huge half million, million dollar homes out in Cooley Ridge, but there's really not much, um, not much affordable housing. People, you know, are applying for subsidized housing and they're on the list for years, for one. I mean, students, when they come out of school, they're not making that much money. Uh, the younger generation, they're more into green ways of transportation. So they want to use uh, the, the transit system or they want to ride their bicycles or something. Right now you can, uh, they've got a bike rack on the transit buses, which is great. They can you know, put their bike on the rack, hop the bus, and then use the bike when they get to their destination. But our transit service doesn't run on holidays. It stops about 7.15 on Saturday and Sunday. It doesn't go after 11 o'clock during the week. And, you know, usually the students, they are working past 11 o'clock. They, they can't take the bus. And that's uh, one of the things that makes people leave a city is you know, the lack of transit service, because not everybody can afford a car. Not everybody wants to spend the money for a car or have to pay for parking downtown or, you know, the insurance. It's just, again, there's your low hanging fruit, you know. I'm going to end with a softball. I, did I, do you guys feel like I gave equal time? Does anyone feel like they did not get enough time? No, that I'm we good. didn't what? Didn't get enough that it wasn't equal time. I tried to get. Oh my goodness, time. Lindsay! You're no, you. <laughs> that was so equal. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so yes, what sure. are some of your favorite places to spend your time in our city, and why, Brian? I like the parks. I really do enjoy the parks. Taking the dogs for walks down there. Um, just, uh, just all around the city. It's there's so. They're nice. Um, there has been a, I've noticed in certain areas that the uh, the care of the parks has certainly deteriorated 
from where it used to be. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Brian. Shyla. Um, so I'm at the dog park every day. So I love the dog park. Um, so that's my thing. And in the summer, I'm on the golf course a lot. I think we have beautiful golf courses in our city that are city owned and they're reasonable um, compared to, you know, the rest of the province with golf. It'd be great if we could get it even less. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, and then come winter, I hibernate because I hate winter. <laughs> I like winter, but I still like to hibernate. Yeah, I'm, I'm a hibernator. A I'm never throwing myself <laughs> down a mountain, so we're good. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say the coolies. The, the coolie trails are amazing. And in True. the springtime, there's all kind of cactus and cactus flowers. And mm. it's really beautiful. Kelly, how about you? Yeah, I love the coolies too. And, uh, you know, the parks, I'll take my cat CB. He's uh, trained on a leash and we'll go for a walk in the park. And nice. You know, I love to walk down by the river. You know, it's yeah. just so peaceful down there. You know, go fishing. There's lots of places to fish. Echo Dale, the river, little ponds here and there. Well, that's great. Um, I am going to wrap us up here. We're just about um, at the end of our time. And I really, really thank you guys for agreeing to do this. I hope that um, everyone found it like a, that it was a productive use of time and I'm hoping we can get um, most of the candidates. I know we have we're going to have limited time, but mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a big group, and it's nice yes. to have that <laughs> personal interaction um, as much as Zoom is personal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really hoping you know in the next four years, like echoing some of your comments, that we move forward in a in a positive direction. We're setting priorities, making decisions on evidence, and and uh, having a more unified community that you know we we all feel like we matter in the city mm -hmm. and that's you know that's a lofty goal but i think that it's achievable yes agreed agreed thank you lindsay for doing this i appreciate yes it. thank you very much thanks lindsay i'm gonna thank take you guys a, i just want to take just a, oh, a second sure. for uh for two things when you were talking about a little bit earlier about the uh the bidding process is there not a lot of it is is regulated by provincial and federal rules out there around the bidding process what they can and can't do i know we tendered for a couple fire trucks and there was a lot of processes there that had to be followed and, and just to, to follow up on the park thing you know we're i'm doing a, a tour of the parks every saturday and sunday so i know that's oh. just fun. <laughs> that reminds me I'm at www.clarkformayor.ca. Kelly. Allard, the number four, mhcc.com. Brian. Uh, Facebook, uh, vote, for, uh, vote for Webster and face and uh, webpage. I think Brian Webster for city council. Awesome. Shyla. VoteSharps.ca and uh, Shyla Sharps for city council. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care. Thanks again, Lindsay. Appreciate Bye. it. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great Sunday night. Have a good night, people. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Good night.